1 with me tonight, please. John 1, verse 14. John chapter 1, verse 14. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Yes. Father, I ask your blessing, Lord, to your holy word now. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> now, when you study the Bible, there's a lot of different ways to study the Scripture. One way is to just simply read the narrative. In other words, just read it. Uh, read it and in, uh, from uh, one book to the next, chapter to the next, so forth. Read the Bible and ask God to give you a... Uh, a, comprehend, a com comprehensive ability to where you can hold and retain what you've read and get a concept of the message that you're reading. Another way to read the Bible or study the Bible is in a historical context, and that is that you're studying the history of Israel in the Old Testament, and you're studying the history of the church, the book of Acts, and then uh, the order of the books, the canon of Scripture. Another way to study the Bible is to study individuals in the Bible, personages, and it's a lot to be learned from that uh, because they're real people just like you and just like me. No question about that. Another way to study the Bible is to study the great doctrines of the Bible. What's the Bible said about blood? What does it say about salvation? Is there any difference between an Old Testament saint and a New Testament saint? What do, how do dispensations fit into this? Things of that nature. Another way to study the Bible is to study it in a comparative way where you compare one book with another. Uh, what's the main theme of this book? What's it trying to say? Uh, what was the purpose in Matthew's gospel? Why did Mark write his gospel and Luke and then John? Uh, is there a difference between the message of Matthew, for example, and the, book, and the message of Romans chapter number 10? Uh, comparing Scripture with Scripture, that's what the Bible says to do. And then when you do this and you study the Bible, ask God to show you the great truths that He'd have you learn. I'm going to show you something tonight about one of the ways to study the Bible, and that is by taking a theme, as I've been telling you before about the Gospel of John, and digging into a few things tonight that relate to that theme. For example, we know that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what's called synoptic gospels. I don't call them that, but that's what they're called. If you go to a Bible college anywhere, do any study, you'll find that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called synoptic gospels. A synopsis is a sin, means to join together. Synopsis is a, is a joining together view by three people uh, who essentially complement each other. But John's different. The Gospel of John is the last Gospel in the New Testament written, probably from 90, 95 A.D., somewhere uh, during that period of time, a good 60 years after the life of Christ. Think about that. 60 years after the life of Christ, the Gospel of John was written. The, uh, the, book is, the books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, if you read them, you get a distinct impression that they're very Jewish in character. There's no question about that. They're very Jewish. And uh, Matthew, for example, is very clear that uh, these are the generations of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. The first things mentioned is David because David was the king. So it gives, it gives you the credentials of, uh, of the Messiah. And Mark starts out immediately with a servant. Then Luke carries you all the way back to God the Creator through Mary. So it's very Jewish in its application. But the Gospel of John, not so. The Gospel of John says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Gospel of John is not directed toward Jews per se. The Gospel of John is directed toward anyone who will read it. That's why it says, These things are written that you might believe, and believing have everlasting life. Therefore, the theme and the message and the object of the Gospel of John is much broader in perspective than simply a Jewish Messiah. This is not to put down the Jewish Messiah in any sense because Christ will come back as the Jewish Messiah and He will reign over the house of Israel and He will reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years. That's going to happen. But you see right now He's not the Jewish Messiah as much as He is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. The Gospel of John, therefore, looks at sin not so much in the sense as it relates to Israel, but as it relates to all humanity. Sin as it relates to humanity. 
The third chapter of the Gospel of John is when Nicodemus came to Christ and said, We know thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do the things thou doest except God be with him. Nicodemus, you must be born again. Matthew, Mark, and Luke say nothing about being born again. Not one word. Not one word in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You mean by that that they are, preacher, that they are against being born again? Of course not. Oh, no, no. They are written beforehand. While a Jewish kingdom was being offered to the Jewish people and a Jewish king was being offered to a Jewish people and they rejected both. And so the focus according to the last chapter of the book of Acts, he's, the apostle Paul says, lo, I go to the Gentiles and they'll hear it. Well, they certainly did hear it because God wrote a gospel to the Gentiles and to the Jew and to any that would hear. And that's the gospel of John. In the Old Testament, you have a concept of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, but it's not at all like the New Testament. The Shema in Deuteronomy chapter number 6 and verse number 4, Hear you, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. That right there is a salient doctrine of Judaism that there's just one God. If you ask any Jew 2,000 years ago if he had a son, God had a son, he'd look at you like you were crazy. God had no son. He had a son in the relative sense where Israel's sons and daughters, but no, he doesn't have a son in the sense that the son is equal with God. Oh, no, 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 no. The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament comes upon men and leaves men. He comes and he leaves. David said, Lord, take not thine Holy Spirit from me. So the ministry of the Godhead in the Old Testament is entirely different than it is in the New Testament. When you get to the New Testament, you get into a very clear distinction about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But it's no clearer anywhere than it is in the Gospel of John. In the Gospel of John, you see the working of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, in a way you don't see it anywhere else. Gospel of John. The reason for that is because the Gospel of John is preaching the new birth. John chapter number 3. You must be born again. Therefore, the Holy Spirit draws men to Christ. Christ takes men to the Father. And the Father takes men back to Christ. No man knows the Son but the Father. No man knows the Father but the Son. In the Old Testament, they had a concept of God the Father, but it wasn't anything like a New Testament concept. The Old Testament concept of God the Father was something that developed over time to where they understood God is a Father to us. And we are His sons and His daughters but it was as relative, as I said before, a relative thing. Now when I say God is my Father, it has nothing to do with my birth. It has to do with my new birth. Think on that for a moment. So therefore the concept of God the Father in the New Testament is a much higher, more powerful thing than it is in the Old Testament. The concept of God the Father, my Father, I call Him my Father, Abba, Father, Romans chapter number 8. We cry, Father, the reason we cry Father is because we've been born of God. The concept of God, therefore, is something that develops in the New Testament in the book of John, unlike Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all mention God the Father, but did you know that the Gospel of John mentions God the Father more than Matthew, Mark, and Luke put together? The Gospel of John, therefore, has God the Father far more than any other book in the New Testament. There are those who rate how certain words show up in the Bible by how the density of those words. How many times does this word show up, say, in 10 verses? And the Gospel of John is right at the top. Of all 66 books in the Bible, Father over and over and over and over again. So there must be some reason why, if you must be born again, John chapter number 3, that God Almighty wants you to know that there's a Father in heaven. This Father in heaven is a very important thing about our relationship with God. No book in the Bible clearly breaks down any more the Godhead than the Gospel of John. Now, I'm not saying the others don't, but I'm saying this. I'm saying the emphasis is laid upon God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And when you look at that, you begin to think to yourself, whether well, you have to be because they all work in unison to get you saved. Remember, it takes all three for you to be born again. Amen. Now, as I've told you before in Sunday school, Gnosticism doesn't like that idea. They have a demiurge in the Old Testament, a lesser God. 
And they don't like the idea that the Old Testament God has anything to do with this great, great spirit, and this great uh, one, this, uh, this uh, monad that uh, Plato called it. They don't like that idea. But when the Lord Jesus Christ showed up, he began to talk about God the Father. He began to talk about that eternal one that dwells alone, that no man has seen except him. The Lord Jesus Christ told them time and time again, he said, I've seen him, but you've never seen him. I know him, but you don't know him. And he said, you'll never know him unless you know me. Through, through me, you'll know him. And they didn't like that. This flew in the face of the Jews, again, uh, and the, especially the Pharisee, who had this special relationship with God. That flew in their face. They didn't like that. They didn't like for somebody to come along and tell them, what do you mean you, we don't know God? Well, we're Abraham's seed, they said to him. The Lord Jesus said, I know you're the physical seed of Abraham, but if you believed Abraham, you would believe me because he wrote of me. Every place that these Pharisees appealed for their authority and their position and their foundation, the Lord Jesus Christ destroyed it. And the reason he did is because their faith was based upon human achievement and man-made works. It wasn't based on the true faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So a study, therefore, as I began to teach you tonight and talk about how that you can study the Bible different ways, a great study is the study of the word Father as it shows up in the Gospel of John. God the Father. God the Father. Now we all believe in God the Son. But the Apostle John in 1 John says that if you deny the Father, you deny the Son. He doesn't leave any wiggle room. He said, if you, don't, if you don't believe in the Father, you don't believe in the Son. You may say you believe in the Son, but if you deny the Father, you've denied the Son. I know it gets into semantics. I know it gets into the idea of definition of terms. I understand that. I, perfect, I firmly reveal, uh, believe that. But let me tell you something tonight that I do not believe. I do not believe that the term Father has to do with an office. I do not believe the term father has to do with not only an office or a, uh, a, a title. No. I believe the term father has to do with someone. However you put it. It's hard to get words right when you're dealing with the Trinity, but it's important that we get something right. I believe the term father is a definite reference to somebody. And the term son is a reference to somebody. And the term Holy Ghost is a reference to somebody. Therefore, when I see my Lord Jesus Christ, I see a second person of the Godhead, but I know there's also a father in that Godhead. And by knowing there's a father in that Godhead, I know I'm believing on Christ because I believe in his father. Now, God the Father is the father of Christ when he begot him in Bethlehem of Judea. And he was the God man born into this world. And God became flesh and walked among us. That happened 2,000 years ago. But the Son of God has always existed, folks. There never was a time when he didn't exist. And God the Father has always existed. There never was a time when he did not exist. And God the Holy Ghost has always existed. There never was a time when he, did, when he, when he didn't exist. And so uh, and we get into theology today and what they're trying to do is feminize the Holy Spirit. By feminizing the Holy Spirit, what you've done is you've brought Sophia into it. We talked about before in Sunday school, Gnosticism, Sophia, you know, the yin-yang, the male, the female counterpart, the opposites that together within the circle create the one whole, and that all kinds of stuff's going on today. They're changing the gender and identity of God. But it's so important to remember this. The Apostle John, who wrote the Gospel of John, and he wrote 1 John, made it very clear if you don't believe in the Father, you don't believe in the Son. If you don't believe in the Son, you can't believe in the Father. You can't have one without the other. You have to have them both. I worry sometimes about my brethren out there, and I pray they truly are my brethren, who deny the Father. And they say that Jesus Christ is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. They'd better look very carefully at what they profess to believe. They'd better be very careful in what they're saying. There is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And the Gospel of John lays it out in his relationship to man. The fatherhood of God in the Gospel of John is, and I can't cover it in one lesson. I mean, how much time I've spent already getting you to, getting you to this point. I've been up here probably 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you know, talking. And there's no way under the sun that I can, that I can even begin to exhaust this tonight. But I've laid a pretty good foundation, don't you think? I'm trying to show you 
the nuances, if you please, and that's, that's a good term for some of these statements of uh, the differences in what people believe. You don't build a church on emotionalism. If all, if all we are here is just the, the, the next band that gets us worked up, and then if, that, if we get tired of that band, we'll get us another band, we're not much. <laughs> we better build the church on doctrine. That doesn't mean that you have to have a cold, orthodox formalism, no. But you certainly need to know what you believe. You need to know what you believe, and why you believe it. Because doctrine, the, Bible, Paul, the apostle Paul said, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and emotionalism. Did I mess up? <laughs> Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Thou hast, from a child, thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, maybe able, able to make thee wise into salvation. The Scriptures, the Word of God. So let's look at just a couple tonight to get an idea of how important this is about God the Father, the Father, the fatherhood of God. God the Father is the Father of Christ in a different way than He's my Father. We need to get that right off the bat. He's God to the Son in a different way that He's God to me. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to my God and your God, my Father, your Father, my God and your God, not our God. The Lord Jesus Christ never ever said our God. He said, my God and your God. And He was saying that as God incarnate in flesh. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's important to understand these, are, these terms, don't just, you don't just throw them around. Uh, they have meaning. So I want you to look at this passage in John chapter number 1 and verse 14. The Word, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the only begotten of the Father, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He told you right off the bat that the Lord Jesus Christ is full of grace and truth. I took truth and ran it through the Gospel of John. Just the word truth. Now the Lord Jesus Christ is the truth. Here's the way that works. Here's the simple way that it works. If you think you've got the truth and you don't have the Lord Jesus Christ, you've swaddled a lie. I don't care how dedicated you are to what you believe, how sincere you are about your doctrine. I don't care who you are and what God you're praying to. If you think you have the truth and you don't have the Lord Jesus Christ, you believed a lie. Because he is truth personified. Now let me give you an example of that. The apostle said to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. The word faith as it's used in that passage refers to the whole collective body of what we believe as Christians. That's the faith, you see. But then there's individual faith. Individual faith as you find it in Hebrews chapter number 11 as it uses each one of these individuals and as an example of that kind of faith, which is a wonderful thing. But the body of faith that we believe has to do with what we believe about Christ. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, and the Bible, and the new birth. So the Bible says here that He is full of grace and truth. Now listen to what it said in John 1.17. For the law was given by Moses, but Moses did not bring grace and truth. Because it says grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Did you get that? Did you get the comparison right off the bat between the Lord Jesus Christ and Moses? Why did he do that, preacher? He did that for Gentiles, who all they know is, well, Moses has something to do with the Jewish people. And so he's letting them know in the first chapter of the Gospel of John, before he goes any further, Moses can't save you. And the law of Moses can't save you. That grace and truth came by the Lord Jesus Christ. He's laying the foundation which he'll build upon, he'll build upon it, for the simple fact that you Gentiles may not know the difference between the, from the, between the Jewish tabernacle and the Passover. You may not know a thing about any of that. But the bottom line is Moses did not bring grace and truth. The Lord Jesus Christ brought grace and truth. And the Lord Jesus Christ is grace and truth. Now when you personify something like that, in plainer words, when a person becomes the truth then if you think you have something and don't have that person, you don't have what you think you have. See what I mean? If you think you have grace, but you don't have Christ, you don't have any grace. 
You've been flim flam. <laughs> Some high pressure salesman has wrapped you around his finger. So the Lord Jesus Christ to receive him is to receive the grace of God. The Lord Jesus Christ to receive him is to receive the truth of God. Now here's what it says in 2 Thessalonians over here. Chapter number 2. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, accelerate and pass a couple of these things and we'll pick them up again. Uh, in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. All right. Verse 12. 2 Thessalonians 2.12. That they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, you can look at that two different ways. Both of them are right. Way number one, they rejected the message of who Christ was and what he did for them and who they are as fallen sinners that need to be saved. Way number two, they rejected the truth personified, the son himself. You see what I mean? All right. So the Gospel of John builds on the simple fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is the truth here and everything else is compared to Him. That's what He's saying. That's what, I, that's what I'm saying. The Lord Jesus Christ is the truth about salvation. He's the truth about damnation. He's the truth about sanctification. He's the truth about grace. He's the truth that separates truth from Moses, truth from the Jew, Truth from sin, truth from the devil, truth from everything. The Lord Jesus Christ is the truth personified. Look at John chapter number 8 and verse number 44. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he's a liar. And the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. And this word is such a wonderful thing the way it's used in John. Now, I may ask you a question tonight. If you want to be saved, if you want to be born again, if you want your sins forgiven, don't you want somebody to tell you the truth? Right? You want the truth. You want them to tell you the truth. You don't want people to gloss over and, and, and you know, and, and, and make excuses for you and say, well, we're all in the same boat together. Just do the best you can, feel good, and go on, go on. Everybody's coming the same way, blah, blah. You want the truth. And the truth is you know you're a sinner. The truth is you know you need help. And the truth is that you know that there's no way you can do anything about your sin. And you know that you're lost without God and you're going to die. And when you die, let me tell you what lies on the other side of death. Damnation and judgment. If you don't know the Lord, that's what waits you. Somebody asked a question, where's hell? Hell is at the end of a Christ-rejecting life. That's where it is. That's a, meta that's a metaphorical way of saying it, but that's exactly true. It's at the end of a Christ-rejecting life. Now, truth. Over and over and over again, the truth is, is showcased in the Gospel of John. Look how it's done over here in John chapter number 3. Verse 21, but he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest. Notice this, he that doeth truth. If you want the truth, it's going to bring you to Christ. See what I mean? For Christ is the light. In him was life, the life's the light of men. John chapter number four, verse 23, the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers, and he said this to the woman at the well, shall worship the father in spirit and and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I'm going to ask you a question. When the Lord Jesus was talking to the woman at the well, and he said, God is a spirit, was he talking about himself or was he talking about the Father? I think he was talking about the Father. Yes, I believe he was talking about the Father. Talking about the Father. You see, the Gospel of John shows you how the Lord Jesus Christ makes the Father known to us creatures. And it's always good to look at it that way because we are so far below that Creator that is, that is a, it, it's insurmountable. It's, it's just, you, can't, you, can't, uh, you can't fathom the distance 
between the creator and the creature. But Christ is the go-between. He's the one who can take hold of you in one hand and the Father in the other and connect the two. And that's what he does in John. That's what he's doing time and time again. If you've seen me, he said, you've seen the Father. All right? Over and over. No man knows the Father but the Son. You don't know where he is. You can't get to him. If you got to him, you couldn't see him because he's invisible. So, look how he says it over here in John chapter number 5, verse 33. You sent to John, he bare witness of the truth. John who now? Who are we talking about here? This is not the apostle John. You sent unto John, and he bare witness unto the truth. Who is that? That's the Baptist, exactly. John the Baptist. How did he bear witness to the truth? What did John say about the Lord Jesus Christ? That's it. That does what? Taketh away the sins of the Jews, right? Did I get it wrong? The sins of who? Write that in your heart. Remember, the gospel of John is not written just to get Jews saved. The gospel of John is written to get everybody saved. This is why it does not start with a genealogy. This is why it says nothing about a Jewish kingdom. This is why the Beatitudes, blessed be the poor, blessed this, not found in the Gospel of John. None of that is in the Gospel of John. Why? Because the Gospel of John is written 90, 95 AD, long after the Jewish kingdom had been rejected. Our Lord Jesus had died was buried, raised again, and seated at the right hand of the Father. Now the Jewish people had been blinded judicially, had been moved to the side, and God had turned to the Gentiles, and he was writing a gospel that was going to get Jew and Gentile saved, and he did it at the very end of the canon of Scripture. It was complete when the gospel of John was written. Folks, no more gospels were written after that. And I can't tell you right now, I can't tell you. You might know, I don't know. I don't know if the book of Revelation was written before the Gospel of John or the book of Revelation was written after the Gospel of John. I think the book of Revelation was probably the last book written in the Bible. And, but the Gospel of John, I believe, is close to it. I don't believe there's much, maybe four, five, ten years that separate the two. See what I mean? See how far down it is? See how far away from the Sermon on the Mount it is. So now think about this for a moment tonight. I want to see you saved. I want to see you go to heaven. I want to go to heaven. Somebody said, why are you, why are you religious? I'm not religious, but I don't go to hell. Huh, that's my answer. Now when you tell somebody that, immediately, it's, uh, immediately you've put them on the defensive because they don't know what to say then. Bottom line. If I got up here tonight and began to preach to you, blessed are the poor, blessed are the, the peacemakers. And then I said to you now, if you're going to be a peacemaker, you're going to be poor. You're going to be a child of the kingdom. See, you're a Christian now because you embrace these great truths. Have I preached the gospel to you? I have preached, and it's the truth. A gospel, and it is the truth, but it is not the truth for the dispensation of the grace of God. And that gets into what's called hermeneutics. And hermeneutics has to do with the interpretation of Scripture, rightly dividing the word of truth, comparing Scripture with Scripture. If you're not a dispensationalist, you can be a Christian, you can be saved, and you can love the Lord. You can love the Lord, you can be saved, and not be a dispensationalist. But you are going to stumble, and you are going to fall, and you're going to have a mess on your hands trying to figure out a lot of these things. That's why I am a dispensationalist because I know every passage of Scripture doesn't belong in the same place to the same people at the same time. It won't work. So what do I preach? If I want to preach the gospel to you tonight, what would I preach? All right, turn to 1 Corinthians 15. Here's that old hated... Paul, the worst corrupter of Christianity. First Corinthians 15, more, uh, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach to you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory 
what I preached to you unless you believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. There's the death. And that he was buried. There's his burial. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Resurrection. And then, of course, he gives the proof. He was seen of Cephas, the twelve, then five hundred brethren. The greater part remained to this present. Some are fallen asleep. Then he was seen of James, the apostles. Last of all, he was seen of me also on the road to Damascus, as of one born out of due season. So what's the gospel? Well, you've got to belong to the right church. Do penance. Uh, do good deeds. Uh, live a good life. Be a good person. And you'll hope at the end that you'll be okay. Is that the gospel? He laid out the foundational truths of the gospel. Christ died for your sins. There's your sins. It's taken care of according to the scriptures. He was buried. His death was a physical death. It wasn't a spiritual death. The docetists taught that he wasn't really a real man. All this uh, garbage in the first century. He died a real death. He was buried in a real tomb. And then three days later, he was raised from the dead. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> raised from the dead. Had he not been raised from the dead, Christianity would have died in the first century. It had been over. It had been finished. The fact that they could not find his body, and believe me, they looked for it. They're still looking, aren't they, brother? You remember what I told you the other day, how that when the Bible says when he died at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I preached this last Sunday morning, 9 o'clock he was nailed on the cross. High noon it went dark. And you couldn't see the hand before your face. 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Father, it's finished. He gave up the ghost. Six hours he hung on the tree. They took his body off of the tree before 6 p.m., before sundown. That's when the next day started, which was a high, holy Sabbath day. It wasn't the Sabbath, Shabbat. It wasn't Saturday. It was the Passover. It was leading in, and that, that, that was a week of Sabbaths. So they took him off the cross three o'clock, some, sometime after 3 o'clock, and, and, uh, and he was in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, in the tomb by 6 o'clock that evening. All right. There he died on the cross at Calvary. There the sin debt was paid. There God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Be ye reconciled to God. Who now was in who doing what at the cross? If there is no God the Father, if that's just a title and an office, who was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself? What you're going to get now, we'll get in next Wednesday night because we don't have enough time, like I said. You're going to see when you get through with the Gospel of John how the Gospel of John absolutely destroys the idea that there is just Jesus only and there is no Father and there is no Holy Spirit. There's simply titles and offices. No, sir. There is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And you can't be saved without all three. Now let's look at this last one and I'll close tonight. Look at 1 John, written by John. Same man. 1 John. And I love 1 John. I don't know how many times I've read this book. 1 John, chapter number 5. Now this is what's called the Johannan comma. I'll read it for you tonight. I wish I had a, another translation. But I'll read it for what we have in the Bible. This is a real Bible, by the way, I've got here in front of me. Y'all got real Bibles? <laughs> First John 5, 7. There are three that bear record in heaven. Remember John now. There are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word. Who's the Word? That's exactly, there's no question about that. And the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. All right. That's the biblical statement about the blessed Trinity. Do I understand the Trinity? No. Do I believe it? Yes. Absolutely. Embrace it fully with my soul. I don't have to understand it. But I do firmly believe tonight there is a Father, there is a Son, and there is a Holy Ghost. 
And there, and there is no salvation without the Godhead. And the Apostle in Colossians says, In him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And that term Godhead is a direct slam at the Gnostics. And all of them who try to make Jehovah in the Old Testament a demiurge, a lesser God. And they certainly do that. And the Bible says over here in the Gospel of John, The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father hath declared Him. Boy, that's a beautiful statement. And it only says it one time in the whole Bible. It says that the Lord Jesus Christ is in the bosom of the Father and He declared Him. That's two words if you'd like to look up between now and next Wednesday night. Bosom and declared. And we'll get into it next Wednesday night. See that? The Son is in the bosom of the Father and He has declared the Father. There is no question that you've got two there. But what does that bosom mean and what does declare mean? We'll get that next week, Lord willing. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray you'd bless the study of your holy word. Thank you for your blessed word. Thank you for the blessed Holy Ghost. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for what you've done for us through our Lord Jesus Christ. Bless thy righteous name tonight. In Jesus' sweet holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening. God